friends and family members who are struggling mightily in their marriages or have ended their marriage because they could not find their way as a couple. Many of you here today are no longer married and I can't begin to know the anguish it has afflicted on you. In fact, I'm very sensitive to the fact that we have a high number of single and divorced men and women in this congregation. And as I speak, you may think this message does not apply to you. I contemplated changing the focus of this message to healthy relationships instead of healthy marriages. But I've been strongly led by God's spirit to to speak directly to the subject of marriage, a God-honoring marriage. Whether you are married, single, widowed, or divorced, you are a sexual being. God created us to be attracted to this opposite sex. So why not interact with one another in affirming life-giving ways? Listen to these words from Ephesians 5. I'm reading from the Message Bible. Watch what God does, and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents, Mostly, what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything, everything of himself to us. Love like that. The bright light of Christ makes your way plain. So no more stumbling around. Get on with it. The good, the right, the true. These are the actions appropriate for daylight hours. Figure out what will please Christ and then do it. Wives. Understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out in her dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. This is a huge mystery and I don't pretend to understand it all. What is clearest to me is the way Christ treats the church. And this provides a great picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself in loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. Now, whether you're married or not, The fifth chapter of Ephesians is packed with great examples of how we should treat one another. Several years ago, I was asked to help choose the title of a book someone I knew had written. The author was a musician in the church. 
And the two options for the title of this book were Surviving as an Artist or Thriving as an Artist. Initially, I chose the first because sometimes that's how it felt to me as a team leader, just trying to survive. But as I considered it more closely, I realized I really didn't want to approach anything in life with a I survived it attitude. I want to thrive in every area of my life. And I don't want my marriage to merely survive. Every Sunday, I read the celebration section of the dispatch, um, where there, uh, there are pictures of couples celebrating their 50th or their 60th wedding anniversary. I love it when they submit a now, a then, and now, <laughs> photo. I look closely at those pictures. Are they happy together? Have they weathered the storms of life and, and are they still deeply in love with one another? Or have they survived another year? I wonder, because that's how I remember my parents they barely tolerated one another, but they survived. You know, I think we all have examples of those kind of marriages. And we have learned that it doesn't make sense to merely survive in an unhappy marriage. But here's what has happened. We as a society now end marriages that are not surviving, and they never have a chance to make it to thriving. The other day I was cleaning out my basement and I ran across a laundry basket full of miscellaneous items. I decided to sort it out and in the process found a book. It had no cover and it was worn. The book was entitled Light Her Fire. For a moment I just held the book. Afraid to open it, I could see that many pages were dog-eared and, and, and several were marked with a bookmark. Slowly, I looked to see if there was a name in the front or an inscription to someone, but there wasn't. This book was in my basement, so there were only a few people who it could have belonged to. Dan or my son, whose basket I had just unloaded. Now our son is 30 and an adult, but I just wasn't sure I wanted to know how he lights anyone's fire. <laughs> then I thought of Dan. He does a good job of lighting my fire, but I was curious to know if this book was the source of his creativity. <laughs> So I sat down and I read this book, cover to cover. And what I learned, and I learned a lot, was that the author originally wrote Light His Fire and took it on the road and inspired women to love their husbands more deeply. Sidebar, Dan and I went to the movies the other day. And we saw Hope Springs with Merle Streep and Tommy Lee Jones. About halfway through the movie, I began to get really irritated. Spoiler alert. <laughs> the plot centers around a couple married 32 years, and they are little more than roommates. They don't sleep together, they barely talk to one another, and they haven't had sex in four years. She wants to thrive, and he's content to survive. She books a flight to New England and a week of intense marriage counseling. At every turn, the husband resists. Throughout the entire movie, she is trying. She's giving 100% to make this marriage work. And it's not until 98% of the movie is over that he decides that he's going to invest in the movie. I wanted to scream, seriously? 
Okay, where was I? Okay, the author had originally wrote Light His Fire, and women took to heart all that the author had to offer, but what the author soon realized was that the man also has to take responsibility to make the marriage strong. I don't think it was a coincidence that I found this book at this time dealing with this subject. So, here's what I'm proposing. This message is going to be predominantly from my perspective. I would like to take you through a few of the jewels that I gleaned from this insightful book. I asked Dan to also read this book, which he hadn't. And together, we will share and see if what we have learned and experienced can encourage and inspire you to give your best. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this day, for bringing us to this very place. Lord, I ask that um, you would just use Dan and I, that the words that we have on this paper, that we would only say what you would want us to say. Father, we trust that you have given us these words so we may build up the body of Christ and glorify you. And we ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. Jewel number one. If you can appreciate her for who she is and find value in her uniqueness, she'll want to become more of a woman for you. There is nothing a woman won't do for a man who makes her feel good about herself. This sentence speaks powerfully to Ephesians 5, verse 26, where it says everything he does and says is designated to bring the best out of her. You know, when Dan affirms something I have said or done, from preparing a meal to serving on a Sunday morning, I feel valued by him, and it inspires me to give my best. Now, Deb is the communicator in our family. I'm not. <laughs> She's the one who is pretty creatively gifted. Me, not so much. She shows compassion, concern, and practices confidentiality. These are terms that when we first got married were very foreign to me. But I'm learning them, and I'm learning them from her. She has a heart that I used to only admire from a distance, but I wanted to understand how she used these gifts. And eventually, still, they started rubbing off on me. We now are able to embrace opportunities to use these gifts together, and that has made us stronger. I've come to appreciate the woman that God has made her to be. And in her uniqueness, we can love more deeply because we can live more completely. The next jewel. Too many people use their past as an excuse for ruining the present. Too many people use their past as an excuse for ruining the present. You, know, you have to make a conscious decision to love someone in a way that you know makes that person feel good. I always have a very difficult time at Christmas time getting just the right gift for Deb. 32 years of doing this, you'd think I'd be better at it. I've had a lot of practice. We as a family are in the habit of writing things down that we want on pieces of paper, things we'd like to receive. Sometimes we go to such great lengths as we put 
an item number, the store that it's at, a catalog. <laughs> and then we magically exchange those gifts, those, those lists with other people, and voila, we get those gifts for Christmas. For Deb and I think, uh, for other members of my family, I really hate this process. I would like to think that I'm capable enough and attentive to enough to know what she might like. I want the gift to be something that I have thought of, thought about her enough with that gift to show that I care. Now, some gifts have not gone over very well over the years, <laughs> like a laundry basket, a disco jumpsuit, but I've learned, and over the years, I have gotten better. Communication is really an art. Sometimes it requires that you make a distinction between what she says and what she means. Quite often, these are completely unrelated. From time to time, most women are guilty of saying one thing and meaning something different. To make matters worse, they expect you to read their minds and know automatically what they really mean, even if they didn't say it. I get nothing. Researchers have found that most women are more intuitive than men. They catch subliminal messages three times faster than men. Remember your mother knowing something was wrong even when you were trying to hide it from her? As soon as you walked in the door, she could tell something had happened. Well, it's human nature to assume that everyone else possesses the same abilities we have. Since most women can usually read between the lines or catch a double meaning in what's being said, chances are that women in your life expect the same of you. Here's a quick course in ESP. If, if you hear the following words, you can assume she means the opposite. If she says, oh honey, you don't have to do that. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> If she says, sweetheart, that's too much money. Oh, no, it isn't. <laughs> that's OK. It's too much of an inconvenience. Oh, no, it isn't. <laughs> no, don't bother. And you had better bother. <laughs> I don't really care. But she does care. Tell me the truth. <laughs> Now, sometimes in situations like this, I find it best not to say anything. <laughs> the next jewel. Conflict is necessary. It leads to growth. You know, arguing is a healthy and necessary method of resolving tension that exists between two people who have different personalities, viewpoints, ways of doing things, and different sets of priorities. This past January, New Song offered a 13-week class on becoming better stewards of our resources called Financial Peace University. I was all about the class. And even though it was an investment in time, I was eager to attend. Dan, on the other hand, not so much. <laughs> Finances are commonly a factor in marital unrest and one of the areas where we are prone to disagreement. Dan was reluctant to air our dirty laundry, but he swallowed his pride and agreed to attend. It caused some conflict because we had to break old patterns of spending and create new ones. But it deepened our commitment to one another and to God. And the reason that it made a difference in our finances is because we had to practice the principles of the class together. And we were held accountable by our facilitator and the people that were in our class. 
Dan possesses the spiritual gift of wisdom. It has taken me many years to embrace that gift. And early on in our marriage, I resisted his wisdom because it was so contrary to my thought process. But I have seen his wisdom at work. And if he would have said no to that financial class, I wouldn't have liked it, but I would have accepted it because I trust him. And sometimes he knows best. Wait a minute, did I just say that or just think that? Oh. <laughs> Marriage is not a theoretical exercise. It indeed takes practice. And just like everything else that you practice, you need to be prepared to do it wrong. In our marriage, some of the most valuable words that I have ever spoken are, I'm wrong, and can you forgive me? I don't like to be wrong. And actually, I, I dislike even more confessing that I'm wrong. But it's amazing what a heartfelt, humbling, I'm sorry can do. Over the course of our 32 years, I've had a lot of opportunities to tell Deb that I was wrong. I regret that I have not acted on all of those opportunities. The next tool. A truly confident man is one who recognizes the potential his mate has and helps her to develop it. Before I go on, let me remind you that although I'm presenting these jewels from the women's perspective, they hold true for both men and women. For example, this jewel can also read, a truly confident woman is one who recognizes the potential of her mate and helps him to develop it. He somehow senses that as she gets a greater sense of self-worth, she has more love to give him. He is not threatened by her talent. He encourages. Last year, it became clear that Dan needed to find a new job, one that valued his expertise and compensated him for it. After much prayer and discussion, Dan accepted a job in Cleveland and this decision required him to be away from home Monday through Friday. This decision was not taken lightly, and we were concerned about how it would affect our marriage. But I knew that Dan's current job was sucking the life out of him, and he needed to take the risk. I didn't love the prospect of living apart, but I knew that he had more to give and he was barely surviving, not thriving in his current employment. I wanted him to be his best. Next week, Deb is going back to school. I'm very proud of her for taking that step. She's going to take classes to be a spiritual director. She's not going to do it for the money or fame or recognition. She's going back to school because God has given her a gift and she wants to share that gift with others. She's going back to school because she has a passion and she wants to develop that passion even more. I will do whatever is needed to see her succeed and with God's leadership, she will succeed. And with this decision, I'm all in. Even if it's only from time to time, is one of the most endearing qualities a man can possess. I'm not talking about being childish. I'm talking about childlike. 
I have always loved the way Dan interacts with children. When we began American Heritage Girls a few years ago, I agreed to be a unit leader. And since I was going to be at the meetings, Dan decided to serve too. What began as keeping the girls entertained before and after the meetings with endless games of up against the wall <laughs> turned into leading science experiments, launching rockets in the parking lot, <laughs> and replicating a meteor shower with tennis balls. When we decided to step down this year, it was Dan who was asked to reconsider. Here's the thing, Dan is an incredibly intelligent man. Sometimes I refer to him as a genius. He's a research chemist, and I, I've seen the labs where he works, and they're filled with very intelligent, socially inept, <laughs> boring, geeky people. Dan is not. The next jewel, emotional versus physical. You know, if a woman's emotional needs are not met, if a woman's emotional needs are not met, she can't respond to her, to her husband physically. Likewise, it is difficult to respond emotionally to your wife unless your physical needs have been met. If a woman isn't fulfilled emotionally, she can't respond sexually. Emotional fulfillment means you've gone out of your way, you've sacrificed, treated her with kindness, complimented her, made special time for her, and most of all, you have made her feel as, she, as if she matters more to you than anyone else in the whole world. Each week I receive a blog entitled Church and Culture by James White. And a recent entry addressed our need to always be connected. He wrote, as a pastor, I have long recommended date night. Such time will never just happen. They must be created. Nowadays, I tend to be more specific. When you sit down for that meal, no texting. When you're taking that walk together in the park, no tweeting. When you're watching that football game, no Facebook. When you're doing anything together as a couple, no iPods, iPads, or iPhones. Why? It's simple. If you're always on, you can never be with. A few weeks ago, Devin and I went to Kelly's Island up on uh, Lake Erie. And we went there with one purpose, just to enjoy each other's company. It was spontaneous. We found a place to stay in two days. And then we got there. We took our bikes and we rode them on the island. We didn't watch television. We didn't bring a computer. Our phones were never turned on. For two days, there were only two people in our lives, and that was each other. Just like when we first got married. Sometimes we forget how love feels unless we allow ourselves to be completely immersed in one another. For two days, up on Lake Erie at Kelly's Island, we did that for each other. Let me speak for a moment about what meeting each other's needs is and what it isn't. We all need to be loved. That's a fact. We all desperately need massive doses of love in our life to be healthy individuals. God says, I want to love you. God is love, and he knows you need to be loved. But we develop a false idea that we need to be loved 
our, our need to be loved is solely dependent upon one person or a group of people. When you expect someone, someone, to meet 100% of your need for love, you're asking for trouble. You're setting yourself up for hurt and opening the door for the fear of rejection. When you look to any other person besides God to meet all your love needs, he or she can't. There's no human being alive that can love you as completely and as fully as you need to be loved. And there never will be. Only God can do that. So the first step is to put God in first place because he is the only one who can ultimately meet all of your needs. Does God ever love us through other people? Of course. Does God want us to love others? Yes. And does he want us to use, does he want to use us as channels of love? Absolutely. But you will never have all your needs met by one person. God never meant it to be that way. They just don't have enough love. Human love is limited, and God's love is unlimited and unconditional. No matter how deep your need is, God can fill it. And so I read the words to Ephesians 5 one more time. This time I'm, I'm just reading the words that concern the wife and the husband. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ, as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church, a love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole, his words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out in her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing so themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. So those are the jewels. Every marriage is in a constant state of growing weaker or stronger. You have a choice. You can take the jewels you have been given and implement them into your relationships or not. The way we treat our spouse is a direct reflection of our devotion to Christ. Don't wait until 98% of it is over before deciding to invest. Will you stand for the closing prayer? Father, we come before you imperfect people,